Hi, everyone. Hi, can I have your attention? Hi. Uh, welcome to the last week, unfortunately, of Social 190. Um, I just have a few quick announcements, um, all of which are covered in the email I sent out either yesterday or last week, so uh, please go read them for details. Um, you're going to get your exams back after lecture today, unless um, you have section after lecture, in which case you'll get them back at the end of your section. Um, if you're in Tuba, Mary, or Emily's section, um, I have your exam, so come find me in the back of the room. Um, Thursday night, we're going to post the final exam, and after that, the TFs are on email blackout. So if you have questions about your exam, um, if you want to pursue a regrade request, um, you need to meet with your TF before Thursday night. Um, they have set aside extra time for office hours this week. Um, you can also come meet with me. I will be sitting in the Greenhouse Cafe tomorrow from 2 to 5 p.m. Uh, you can just drop by any time during that time. Um, but we would like to talk with you about how the exam went and about the course material before Thursday. Um, after Thursday, uh, we will have a system set up so that if you have administrative questions about the exam, you can get those answered. Um, but none of the TFs will be able to um, answer any of your substantive questions. Um, and one final reminder that there is section this week and you are expected to go. Um, if you have a Thursday section, you can go to section earlier in the week, but you have to arrange that ahead of time. Don't just show up for a different section. Okay, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thanks. All right. Oh, that's good. Um, so uh, last time we discussed the possible implications of biotechnology and other advances for human health. And we talked a little bit about the unresolved debate between Sandel and Harris. And afterwards, some of the students pointed out to me that actually Sandel is most extensively treated in chapter seven, which I didn't assign. Uh, and uh, it used to be because I used to assign um, uh, Michael's book uh, against perfection um, but then after a few years, I decided no longer to assign it because I thought Harris treated him fairly. So, um, but anyway. Uh, we also alluded to Jay Hughes's argument about the hand-in-hand -hand nature of technology and democracy for human welfare. That as technology advances, we need to think about how the polity, how a kind of democratic citizenship might go about regulating not only which technologies we get, because I actually don't think that's possible, but regulating or affecting how those technologies are distributed within our, our society. So I don't think we can stop these technologies, but I do think we need to give some serious thought to how uh, people will get access to these technologies, especially since we need to be concerned about the potential for widening gaps between the rich and the poor, for example, as we've seen earlier in the course. We also talked a little bit about the practical and moral problems raised by situations at the boundary between life and death, between people and animals, and between people and machines. Now, Gabe just finished some basic announcements about the midterm and the final, but just to be, make sure that as many people as possible have the chance to see these things, I'm just going to quickly review them again so there's no confusion. And if you have friends that aren't here today, please let them know any key points, especially if they're sort of slackers. We really don't want you know, complaints a week from now that they don't know these basic things about the exams. And all of this information is also on the course website. We tend not to be very sympathetic if you neither come to lecture, nor look at the slides, nor talk to your friends. It's hard for us to do more than that. Uh, so, um, so here's the distribution for midterm number two. Uh, I think Gabe already sent out, I think the mean or median were around 87 or so. Uh, about 24%, 23% got an A. About 16% got an A minus, so about 48% overall in the A range. And then you had this sort of distribution after that. I, th I can't remember how many about, uh, about uh, less than 5% or so got less than a 70. Uh, those of you that are in that category, if you got less than a 70, unless you're very confident that you did really well on the first midterm and there's a good explanation for this and maybe you're taking the class pass fail so you're not as motivated or, or you were really sick and you showed up for exam anyway or something like that and expect to do well in the final, now before Thursday is a good time to reach out to your TF and talk a little bit about your performance and what might be done about it. So just a small uh, tale of the distribution. Uh, to recapitulate, I talked about all these points last lecture, but for those of you that weren't here, let me just quickly make, highlight a few points about the final exam. We've got 430 of these exams. It sucks that we have to evaluate you. I should say, who knows how the Oxford system works, how, how teaching is done at Oxford University? 
you, at Oxford University, your instructor is totally different than your evaluator. So like I would be giving you all these lectures and then I would turn you over to a different set of human beings who would then examine you, typically orally, to see did you learn anything. It's actually a very interesting way to decouple the instructional and evaluative components of education. Unfortunately, at Harvard, we don't have that system, so I have the unpleasant task of also supervising your evaluation. So please help us, because we have 430 of these exams to grade in seven days. And we have to double check all our arithmetic, do everything. So we will deduct points. I don't mean to be so serious about this, but please help us, because we just can't do the task if you don't cooperate. So it's an open book, open note, no extra reading required exam. We may give you like a short article or something to read as part of the questions, so that will be the extra reading, but we don't expect you to read anything else beyond what's been assigned in the class or what we give you for the exam. No other research or reading is required. Um, you must work on your own. No collaboration with others is uh, accepted whatsoever. Do not plagiarize from others or from sources. Please don't do this. It's a big pain in the ass for everybody. And if you do quote blocks of text from someone else, at least cite them. Okay, do not just wholesale quote, even from notes. Okay, if you use some notes from some place and you don't know where they came from, if you don't cite the notes for sure, you will be in serious trouble. If you cite them, you might be in modest trouble, okay? But there's no benefit from not citing notes, your sources. Uh, the exam will be broadly synthetic of the entire course. It'll be totally unlike the midterms. It's cumulative. There'll be sort of big overarching questions and good answers will integrate readings from multiple lectures. Um, There'll be about 14 to 16 pages of writing expected. We'll probably have two questions. Pick one from each of two pairs. We haven't written the exam yet, but that's it. As usual, the exam will be blindly graded. After it's graded, we disassemble the exam. It goes, gets graded, gets reassembled, gets checked. Uh, and then your, then your TFs also review your individual section TFs, review your overall performance. We're going to post it on the course website at 5 p.m. this Thursday. After that time, your TFs can't talk to you about any substantive issues, including things having to do with your midterm. So if you have any questions about your midterm, you've got to ask them this week before Thursday. Then if you have any sort of clarification or other issues about the final, what we'll typically do is they'll go to Gabe, we'll set up some kind of a system, and then any one of you who asks a question will accumulate all the questions and send them out to all of you once or twice a day uh, during reading period. Uh, this is very important to us, guys, because we have just such a logistic headache. You must deliver a hard copy of the exam to Gabe in room 455 on Thursday, May 9th. He'll be there between 2 and 5 p.m. Okay? You can send a friend to deliver a hard copy, but a hard copy must be delivered. We'll be checking them off. If you don't deliver a hard copy by the end of that time period, you'll be in serious uh, trouble. Okay? We'll deduct major points. We'll fail you. I don't know what we'll do, but it won't be, oh, never mind. We have to be done because as soon as that happens, we need like an army of people to track, disassemble, check the exams and so forth. Do not forget to put your ID number on the top of every page uh, so that if your exams get split up, we can reassemble them, that's required. You must also upload an electronic copy to our Dropbox because we use sort of plagiarism detection software. Uh, that does not have to happen before five. That just has to happen before, by the end of the day, an identical copy to your exam must be uploaded, no changes. So you can just, after you turn in your handwritten copy, go home and upload the copy. Don't forget to do that. It's very easy. Don't have a, what's it called, a, uh, the kind of error we discussed in iatrogenesis, you know, when you forget the last step uh, and you don't do that. Um, and there'll be very specific instructions. Please read and follow those instructions. Any questions about the final? Oh, and all past years of finals have been uploaded to the course website, so you can look at the kinds of questions we've asked in the past if you'd like to have a look at them. Okay, so, um, so today we're going to be kind of having a, a very quick overview of a number of possible policy implications of some of the work we've been discussing. Now, we've alluded to that throughout the course, and in fact, you could have a whole semester-long course on health policy, which this has not been. Um, and so today we're just going to pick up like a few highlights, a few interesting ideas, uh, which were summarized in the readings, just to talk about some of the issues that are relevant to how we might take advantage of the knowledge that we've acquired so far to intervene in the world and hopefully make it better. Now, it's fairly shocking to realize that a very large fraction of our population, perhaps 46 million people, until very recently and still, lacked health insurance, and that their number was, in fact, rising. And this, in fact, is different from every other industrialized democracy. And this fact, coupled with a manifest inefficiency and inequity in the system, 
that we had of insuring people in our society prompted the passage of health care reform three years ago. Now, when we speak about this problem, it's important to realize that we do indeed have insurance in our society, you know, socialized medicine. We do actually have that for everybody above the age of 65. So you get to be in Medicare if you're above 65. So all this radical hue and cry about what we were doing really is, is sort of insane because actually we already do that for everyone older than 65. All of the ideas related to what to do about people between 19 primarily and 64 years of age. Now whether adults in that age range lacked insurance or had insurance depends very much on their income. So for example, uh, this looks at the percentage of adults without health insurance, uh, and this is an old data now, but going into 2005, this is insured now, but had a period of uninsurance in the past year, or uninsured now, so in the last year, have you lacked insurance, basically? So in 2005, 28% of people overall in the United States, uh, adults, lacked health insurance. And not surprisingly, it varied by your income. The poorer you were, the more likely it was that you lacked health insurance in a given uh, year. And interestingly, however, most people who lacked health insurance actually were employed. So they were working, but they didn't have health insurance. So this shows the, the adult work status uh, of individuals uh, who lack health insurance. Almost half of them were employed full time, but they didn't still have health insurance. And 15% part time, only about a third were unemployed. And, and most of them, even more, had at least one family member who was working. So about two thirds of individuals who lacked health insurance had at least one person in the family who was insured. And in fact, it was data like these that suggested to policy analysts that the workplace might be the best means or the best venue for providing health insurance. So if you were you know, in the administration, the George Bush or the Obama administration, you're trying to figure out, oh my god, we need to do something about health insurance, you might look at this and you say, well, actually we could reach two thirds of uninsured people if we somehow grafted on an insurance program similar to perhaps what we already have to uh, workplace expectations. If workers, if em employers were somehow mandated or facilitated or we had laws or policies that required them to provide health insurance as part of their compensation. And not surprisingly, lacking insurance results in a significant reduction in access to health care. So if you look at, for example, this shows health insurance and access to different sorts of medical care. This is the percent of adults reporting the following problems in the past year because of cost. So didn't fill a prescription. Only 18% didn't fill a prescription if they were fully insured, but 43% uh, if they were uninsured. Didn't see a specialist when one was needed. Again, lacking insurance increasing, substantially increases the risk. Skipped, skipping a medical test, same story. Had a medical problem, but didn't see a doctor or a clinic. So if you, ha lack, if you have insurance, only 15% of the time do you not bother to go see the doctor. If you have a medical problem, of course, if you don't have insurance, it rises to almost 50%. And of course, cumulatively, any of these four problems is shown on the far right. But of course, by now, you know, we all know that there could be confounding factors associated both with not having health insurance and with not seeking medical care. Data like these don't prove that it's the lack of medical uh, insurance that results in seeking medical care. Maybe you're the kind of person that's just disorganized, so you neither have insurance nor go to the doctor. It's not the lack of insurance that causes you not to go to the doctor. It's the fact that you're a disorganized sort of person. So we can't be 100% sure what's going on, whether this is a causal story, that something about your insurance arrangements affect your access to care. And plus, if you've learned anything else in this course so far, you've probably learned that I, and hopefully by now you, are at least very unsure about whether medical care is the crucial determinant of health at all. I mean, giving people insurance isn't necessarily going to improve their health if all it does is get them to get more medical care, since by now you've learned that actually medical care is not the main, if even a significant driver, of what happens at the population health level. Now, as I mentioned, the United States is not only unusual in its lack of public health insurance for all, but it's also extremely backward. All of these European countries have had compulsory health insurance, some for over 100 years. So Germany has had compulsory health insurance at the population level since 1883, Austria and Hungary, Luxembourg, Norway, Serbia beat us by 100 years to the punch, uh, which is just unbelievable. Uh, Great Britain, Russia, Switzerland, Irish Free State, France, here we are, Romania, Estonia, and Bulgaria are doing a better job than we are. Portugal, 
Uh, even Greece, <laughs> by 1922, has, uh, has done this, and we are sort of 90 years uh, behind uh, the homeland of my parents. So, um, so all of these countries had some form of compulsory health insurance uh, well before we did. Other sort of civilized, if you will, uh, democracies or, or not, at least European countries. And now, a number of solutions to this lack of insurance and to our backwardness have been proposed. And these solutions include um, extending the workplace insurance program that I just mentioned to, and these are all discussed in Cutler's book that was assigned in the readings. Um, implement some kind of single-payer system, like let's extend Medicare. We already have a single-payer system for, uh, for the elderly. Why don't we just extend that to uh, everybody? Or provide some kind of public pool with mandatory enrollment. Make up some kind of alternative insurance uh, scheme whereby individuals uh, could participate. And Cutler, in the readings, pro uh, Professor Cutler here, uh, proposes a solution that tries to meld the best elements of both a single-payer uh, system and market competition. And he argues that this will align incentives and help, help improve the quality of care. And as he argues in his book, health insurance is not something that is necessarily made better by tying it to the employment. So why do that? Although on the one hand, it would seem very convenient to tie health insurance to one's employment, it's actually very idiosyncratic that that's the case in the United States. And although we could reach a lot of people by doing that who are currently uninsured, it's not like health insurance is improved or the process of getting it is improved by connecting it to employment. So why should we do that necessarily? Um, and as I said, remember, we have Medicare for the elderly, so why not just do that for everyone? Now, the, uh, the, uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010 had a number of key provisions regarding the uninsured that finally started to address this problem that's taken us over a century to, to address. And this act, which was passed while you were in high school or college, is complex, and it reflected a number of political realities, and you could actually teach a whole course just on that. And it's not a perfect uh, law, set of laws, uh, but it's not bad either. It has a number of key provisions. It requires citizens and legal immigrants to have insurance. We have to have everyone have insurance because otherwise uh, we wouldn't be spreading the risk appropriately. If you, know, if you knew that you didn't need insurance and you opted out, well, then we would only be insuring those that need insurance, and that doesn't work from an economic point of view. It creates state-based so-called American health benefit exchanges through which individuals can buy coverage with a whole complex set of incentives uh, that even the Supreme Court had to weigh in on. Uh, it has an individual mandate, which is incentivized by a penalty. It requires employers to provide coverage, and it also gives them complex incentives. And it expands Medicaid and Medicare in certain ways. So basically, you know, the balloon was kind of deformed on all of the things that I discussed earlier to try to like, capture as many people as possible. And of course, for insurance to work, it must distribute risk. We don't want only the ill to buy insurance for obvious reasons. And we don't want people to not buy insurance and then simply impose their costs on us anyway, which is what actually happens nowadays. So what happens nowadays, if you're seriously sick, you, if you don't have health insurance, you don't get any kind of routine care because it has to come out of your own pocket. That may often, not always, often make health care problems worse. And then you wind up in an emergency room or collapsed on the street. And because we are a civilized society, we don't let people drop dead on the street without doing something. And we don't turn people away from hospitals if they arrive exsanguinating. We don't say, I'm terribly sorry, you don't have insurance, just die. Uh, so we provide the care anyway. So that cost is still distributed to the rest of us, just in a very inefficient way if, uh, if you handle the uh, uninsured in that fashion. So here's how the act, the, the uh, the, the, um, the, the act I just mentioned uh, is predicted to affect the problem of the uninsured. On the left, there are 162 million people in the employer market, uh, which is shown in, uh, in red. Uh, there's Medicaid uh, and, ch and uh, uh, Medicaid and related programs shown in blue. Uh, Non-group um, non group or other is shown in yellow, and in the uninsured are shown in green. So there are 162 million people in the employer market, 50 more people, 54 million people who are uninsured, 35 million people on Medicaid or CHIP, and 30 million people in the non-group or other market. And that is the before picture. And on the right, you have the after picture. And here, we have 159 million Americans in the employer market, 44 million on Medicaid, 25 million on the non-group or other, and uh, 
24 million uh, in the exchanges. And only 22 million people, only 22 million people are left uninsured. So the uninsured category has gone from the second largest to the smallest as a result of this intervention. And though there's no public option, there are a lot more people eligible for uh, public programs in this uh, situation. Well, why is there an uninsured category at all? Like, who are these 22 million people that despite this you know, landmark legislation that took forever to get through Congress, uh, you know, over the last 50 years, ever since Nixon, uh, presidents have been trying to do something about this problem. Well, um, who are these uninsured people? About a third of the remaining uninsured are illegal immigrants, which I find very interesting. I mean, we're having an ongoing debate in our society about the status of illegal immigrants. I just would invite you to think about what it means to be a sort of a, a stranger in your own country, as it were. You know, many, many at Harvard, there are probably about 30 or 40 students at Harvard, you may or may not know any of them as your friends. They were brought across the border when they were one or two years old. They went to public schools in this country. They speak English fluently. They are your peers, and yet they're uninsured. When they go home for vacation, they have to drive to California. They can't fly because they don't have ID cards. They can't work in the summer because they're not employable. And yet they'll graduate from Harvard just like the rest of you. It's totally unclear why such individuals and many others like them don't warrant being treated as, uh, you know, in, uh, in a more civilized fashion in our society. And European countries have struggled with this problem for quite a while because of their different sort of border system and their geopolitical location. Uh, and they have come to the conclusion that it's really not very good for a society to have large numbers of people within the society who have no papers and no sort of stake in the society. Anyway, we did not fix that problem as, as part of uh, this. So about a third are illegal immigrants. Um, uh, then there are some people who have incomes below the uh, individual mandate threshold um, under the terms of the individual mandate. You know, if it's more than 8% of your monthly income, blah, 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 there are all these rules. They kind of fall through the cracks. They make just enough money, but not enough uh, to qualify. And there are other people who decide to pay uh, the individual mandate's penalty of $750 rather than purchase insurance. And still others are eligible for various public programs, but don't sign up. So there's a kind of hodgepodge of other individuals beyond that two-thirds. So this act, uh, with respect to this act, the population of the un uninsured will be far reduced, and the remaining uninsured will be primarily composed of illegal immigrants, the few people who can't afford their insurance and aren't getting subsidies to help them purchase it, and people who decide to pay the penalty rather than purchase the insurance after all. However, all this talk about insurance and how important it is actually hasn't really focused on what we would regard by now in the class to be the essential issue. Because having insurance does increase the use of medical care, but it's unclear whether the use of medical care actually increases health. So the financial details of the kind of insurance you have and the effect of having insurance at all was evaluated in a landmark experiment called the RAND Health Insurance Experiment, which was conducted in the 1970s. This involved 2,000 non-elderly families in various locations around the country. And these families were randomly assigned different kinds of health insurance, including totally free care. And not surprisingly, the more people had to pay for their own care, the less they used of it. So people were randomly assigned to these types of care things. They had to, the care was free. They paid 25%, 50%, or 95% of their care. And then they looked at, you know, how did that affect what you did? Here is the impact on in-person visits. The more you had to pay, the less likely you were to go to the doctor. The more you had to pay, roughly speaking, the less likely you were to be admitted to the hospital, uh, the less likely you were to get at any health care use, and, um, and the less total consumption in 1991 dollars you had, the more you had to pay. But um, we just saw that cost sharing is higher when um, you, know, you have to pay more, and use of medical care is lower. But the question is, were the people who used more medical care the better for it? Did you benefit from having insurance that allowed you to use more medical care? And the answer pretty much is no. Uh, so uh, here's the cost sharing plan versus a free plan. Uh, here's your physical function uh, on a score from 1 to 100, no difference. Your mental health, no difference. Your likelihood of smoking, no difference. Your weight, no difference. Your serum cholesterol, no difference. Your, uh, your diastolic blood pressure, a slight difference, about one point, the only significant thing here. Uh, and your far vision using Snell and Lies, uh, slightly uh, better, uh, probably because you got glasses uh, under the insurance uh, program versus not. 
and your risk of death was uh, no different uh, in the two uh, plans. So hence, free care had no effect on the major health ca habits that are associated with cardiovascular disease, which is a leading killer in our society. Giving people free care didn't affect whether or not they were able to address these issues. Now, I'm not saying that nothing makes these issues better. There are things which can get people to stop smoking or regulate their cholesterol, but providing them free care is not one of those things. So giving people insurance is not a panacea. It's not going to miraculously make our population better, although it is a good and necessary thing to do. Um, and there was some mild improvement in hypertension, which at the population level, as we saw a few lectures ago, is not trivial. So, um, and in fact, as you can see, as we remember from earlier lectures, even those in our country, such as the elderly on Medicare, who have always had insurance for the last 40 or 50 years, do not often get valuable medical treatments. So this is the key point. Access to medical care, let alone the proper use of medical care, should not be conflated with merely having insurance. Okay? So when you say, well, we need to improve access to care, what exactly do we mean by that? just simply giving people insurance, making sure they go to the doctor, or making sure that they go to the doctor and get something that actually helps them and makes them better. Three different things. Well, what can be done to increase the quality of care in our society or to um, make the care that we deliver more impactful upon patients? To follow up on one of Cutler's arguments about how to best align incentives to maximize quality, perhaps we can align incentives between providers and payers and patients by returning money to patients if the doctors aren't able to actually help them. And one idea, an old one as it turns out, is to pay providers only if the patient gets better. So here's an old you know, uh, ad for Emerson's Bromo Seltzer, all headaches instantly cured or money refunded, the ad says, legal guarantee. So Emerson's Bromo Seltzer, the most successful American remedy in an effervescent powder taken in water. If, uh, if three doses do not cure any headache, no matter how caused, uh, and the bottle, uh, send the bottle to us saying we're obtained, and we will at once refund the price, blah, blah, blah. That's a pretty good bet, actually, as you all know, how these guys made money. For example, in the medieval times, there were doctors who, doctors who prescribed medicines for syphilis, but most primary syphilis, you get a little sore, and it goes away within 24 hours anyway, so I can give you uh, any kind of medicine I want and guarantee that it'll make it go away, and you'll think it's terrific. Most headaches, as you guys know, remit, uh, and the few people that are dropping dead from a stroke, well, I can, they'll either won't return the bottle or I can just refund one out of 100 cases for that. The rest of the people will be ecstatic about the success of my uh, thing. And it's precisely because of this, of course, that we need randomized trials to evaluate whether um, drugs work or not. But anyway, the point here is, is that you provide a money-back guarantee. It's an old idea. Um, and in fact, this is what paying for quality, as Cutler and many others have advocated, carried to it lo its logical extreme would need. We would only pay for proven success. If we're going to try to align financial incentives to pay for quality, maybe we should only pay when the patient gets better. And just last week, there was a big uh, set of articles, I don't know if you saw them, in the New York Times and elsewhere, about how hospitals have these perverse incentives. If they injure you, they actually get more money as a result. So they were trying, let's stop that. Let's only pay if the treatment actually works. Well, this is a very old idea. Uh, here's a contract between a patient and a doctor from Genoa in the year 1244. And it says the following. In the name of the Lord, amen. I, Rogerio de Bruch of Begamo, promise and agree with you, Basso the wool carter, to return you to health and to make you improve from the illness you have in your person that is in your hand, foot, and mouth, in good faith, with the help of God, within the next month and a half, in such a way that you will be able to feed yourself with your hand and cut bread and wear shoes and walk and speak much better than you do now. What do you think Boss of the Wool Carter had? Any guesses? Probably a stroke, huh? Uh, and I shall take care of all the expenses that will be necessary for this. And at that time, you shall pay me seven Genoese lira, and you shall not eat any fruit, beef, or pasta, poor Basso, whether boiled or dry, I don't know who eats dry pasta, or cabbage. I don't know what the problem with cabbage is. If I do not keep my promises to you, you will not have to give me anything. And I, the aforementioned Basso, promise to you, Rogerio, to pay you seven Genoese lira within three days after my recovery and improvement. This is a good contract between a doctor and a patient. If you make me better, I pay you. Otherwise, I do not. Um, 
And actually, there are more modern examples of this. Uh, here's some recent examples from a range of conditions. In 1994, Merck offered refunds to patients who had been prescribed finasteride, uh, finasteride if they required surgery for benign prostatic hyperplasia after a year of treatment. Sandoz introduced a money-back guarantee for clozapine for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Merck promised to refund prescription costs if simvastatin plus diet did not help lower LDL cholesterol. Uh, Novartis launched a no-cure, no-pay initiative for val valsartan for hypertension in the U.S. and Denmark. Lilly had a no-cure, no-pay on, uh, on a drug for erectile dysfunction. Uh, patients who were not satisfied with the treatment were issued with a voucher for the oral treatment of their choice. Uh, <laughs> Bayer launched a no-cure, no-pay initiative on another one for erectile uh, dysfunction. So, <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so Muldrup, uh, in the reading for today, advocated, advocates for this idea and suggests ways of evaluating good circumstances for this policy. For, so if we're going to try to roll out something like this and make it widely available, which part of the, which types of problems or which part of the healthcare sector might we be able to effectively do this? And he says, for example, this is likely to work if there can be simple methods that can be used to measure the effect, for example, blood tests, uh, and if the patient or the practitioner can see the effect themselves, for example, smoking cessation, erectile dysfunction, infections, or baldness, very obvious, uh, you can evaluate. And I don't think that this idea is likely to be implemented on any kind of meaningful scale but I think it is very rational, and I think it would work. Plus, it's provocative to think about. Like, how could we optimally align incentives in, in population health, let alone individual health care, to get the most value for the dollars that we are spending? For example, how do we determine, and it raises other questions. For example, how would we determine efficacy? What counts as efficacy? And who gets to decide whether the drug actually works? Uh, you know, would the patient say, this is not a firm enough erection? And the doctor would say, I'm sorry, that's adequate. You know, the drug actually counts. You know, how would we evaluate whether the drug is working or not? Um, and how do patients determine efficacy anyway? You know, how do we know how patients are concluding whether drugs work? And maybe there are elements to this idea, such as paying for quality of care, that would be worth implementing. Now, I'd like to just uh, take a short digression to give you uh, an illustration of um, a set of points that were made by a, a colleague of mine at the University of Chicago, Tomas Philipson. And Tomas uh, took this little insight that I just showed you and put it to an extraordinary use. So imagine I'm conducting a randomized controlled trial of a drug. I'm a doctor. You're all patients. And you half are going to get the drug, and you half are not. At the end of the trial, how do I decide if the drug is working or not? How do I decide? Who's done thought about randomized controlled trials? Any ideas? I specify some outcome, like, you know, oh yes, in the back. Yeah, I could use the statistical thing, that's right. I actually didn't mean at that level of detail, I meant something much simpler, so maybe you guys didn't understand what I was talking about. So, uh, so I said, okay, well, we're going to measure, you know, average blood pressure in the guys that get the drug and compare it to average blood pressure in the guys that don't get the drug. Or if it's a cancer treatment, I'm going to do CT scans on all you, and I'm going to measure the size of the tumor, and I'm going to compare average size in the treated to average size in the not treated, and, and I, the doctor, will then conclude that the drug worked according to my specified outcomes by comparing the outcomes in the two groups. Is everyone with me so far? Okay, meanwhile, what are the patients doing? The patients are being, have a sickness, they're being given a medication, and the patients are also deciding whether the drug works for them or not. And this is a subtle part, and I don't expect any of you to come up with it. The way the patients uh, tell you whether they think the drug is working is by continuing to take the drug. So in a randomized controlled trial, if let's say I, take a, I, I, I randomly assign you guys to get the drug and you guys not to get the drug, and 80% of you respond get better, and 20% of you respond and get better, I would conclude after that the drug works, I the doctor. But now the patients, you guys over here, you're like spitting blood. You're vomiting every minute when you're taking the drug. So most of you say to hell with that and you stop taking it. So, you know, 50% of you drop out of the trial. You say, I'm not participating in the trial. And over here, uh, only 5% of you drop out of the trial. Now, I, the researcher looking at data like that, might conclude that in the opinion of the patients, the drug doesn't work. 
You're integrating all the information. You say, I don't care if this thing the doctor thinks is important, which is that my tumor size is getting smaller, uh, actually makes a difference because I'm vomiting 24 hours a day. I'm not going to take the drug. So the patient integrates all the information and comes to a conclusion about whether the drug works or not using a different metric than the doctor. Is everyone with me still? What Tomas, who is an economist at the University of Chicago, came up, observed is he said, who of these two actors do you think has more of a stake in correctly discerning whether the drug works or not? The doctor or the patient? Raise your, think, raise your hand if you think the doctor has a bigger stake in understanding whether the drug works in an RCT. Raise your hands if you think the patient has a bigger stake. Okay, what's at stake for the doctor? I am a doctor and I'm doing this trial and I have to decide whether the drug works or not, so what's at stake for me is my professional reputation, like whether I'm a good scientist and I get to publish an article. If you're the patient, what's at stake is whether you live or die. It's your own body. So according to sort of any kind of rational actor model, when you have real stakes, that person should be making a more informed decision. And so what Tomas argued was that if we looked at randomized controlled trials, the only trials we should believe are the trials of the following. So here is the patient evaluation. And the question is, you compare the dropout rate in the treatment arm to the dropout rate in the no treatment arm. And if the dropout rate is higher in the, in the, treatment ar in the no treatment arm than in the treatment arm, you conclude that the, the, the patient thinks the drug works. If the dropout rate is higher in the treatment arm than in the no treatment arm, in the opinion of the patients, the drug did not work, doesn't work. And here, you let the physician do his usual mucking around, deciding whether or not the drug works or doesn't work according to whatever metrics he or she wants. And then what Tomas says is we should only believe trials in which both the patients and the doctors come to the conclusion that the drug works or that the drug doesn't work, and that the off-diagonal elements, we should not believe those trials. If you read a trial, and in the trial, the, the researcher says, patients who got the drug did better than patients who did not, but then you read more carefully and you see that the dropout rate is higher in the treatment arm than in the no treatment arm, you should be very suspicious about whether, in fact, that drug works. It may work, but only in a very narrowest sense of the word. Another idea to improve medical care is to pass more laws regulating the actual practice of medicine or patients' interactions with the healthcare system. And the key idea here is that laws might be used to affect health and healthcare. And we've seen some examples in the domain of tobacco and seatbelt use. And the issues are different, of course, when we are trying to legislate certain kinds of behavior in doctors and, rather than in patients. And such laws, in fact, are very rare. Laws, for example, prescribing how doctors report mammograms or give advanced directive counseling, for example, in the 1990s uh, are, are some of the few exceptions. Uh, but there is legislation. Uh, there's legislation regarding uh, vaccination of children, uh, reporting of mammography to patients, reporting of infectious diseases to authorities, and information provision having to do with advanced directives or, uh, or breast cancer treatment options. So doctors are required to inform women uh, of what their options are when it comes to breast cancer. We don't have the same kind of laws for any other kind of condition. Um, and here, and, and this issue, uh, uh, this, uh, the issue in this particular example shown here is, uh, is whether women with breast cancer got full mastectomies or equally acceptable lumpectomy with radiation and chemotherapy uh, before and after a law was passed. And I think this reading was assigned for today. So out of concern that women were not being given adequate information, several states passed laws in the 1980s that required physicians to inform patients, both orally and in writing, about treatment options with respect to breast cancer. And so uh, the question becomes, what happens to breast-conserving surgery? So women had two options at that time. You can either have a full mastectomy, or you could have just a lump taken out and have radiation or chemotherapy. It turns out that there's not a lot of difference, no difference, in fact, some evidence suggests that breast-conserving surgery is better uh, in that situation. The question is, what choices do women make when you require the doctors to tell them about their choices? So here is in Detroit, uh, and here's, uh, here's what's happening to the percentage of breast-conserving uh, surgery. The law is passed, and then you get, and this is the trend line here, and these little bars are much higher uh, in the time period after the passage of the law. And something similar is observed here in Hawaii, Here's when the law is passed at a different time point. These bars are much higher than the trend line. Here, again, a similar blip up after the law is passed, and here also after the law is passed. So uh, there seems to be, and the time where the law is passed varies across these different settings, 
there seems to be some temporary, it turns out, unfortunately, not permanent, bump up in doctor's practice after you pass these regulations. Uh, and the dip in 1987 in breast conserving surgery that's seen everywhere uh, is because Nancy Reagan very publicly and famously uh, ha had a total mastectomy for her breast cancer, and it, it affected the choices of women across uh, the whole country. So making uh, information more widely available, uh, so, le so legislation is another possibility we just discussed. Still another possibility is making information more widely available, and this is also a potentially low-cost way of improving health. And the internet is doing just that. Uh, and as a result, it's leading to radical changes in the doctor-patient relationship. So, um, so it's just astonishing. 40% of people with internet access use it to get health information. 48% of those with a chronic illness felt the internet use improve their understanding of their condition. And 27% of those with a chronic illness felt that internet use improved their ability to manage their condition by themselves. And patients nowadays come into the office with more knowledge. They can gather experiences and interact with other patients with their condition from all over the world. They can get non-medical perspectives on their treatments and second-guess their doctors. And they can band together and advocate politically to change the practice that is given to them. And in fact, the population older than 65 will swell from 35 million to 53 million by the year 2020. And these individuals, for a variety of reasons, including increased access to medical information, patients' rights movements, and the consumer choice movement, will bring increasing sophistication to their healthcare and counters. And some have even argued that this will accelerate the movement and awareness of self-care and wellness and will irreversibly alter the traditional doctor-patient relationship. So even in, in, you know, up until a few years ago when I saw patients, um, patients would come in knowing so much more. Like 20 years ago, I could tell them something about their disease and they were so grateful for that alone. Now that's not enough. I have to do something different, something they can't just get by interacting with thousands of other people with their condition. And in some ways, the internet will help us realize the vision that was articulated by Illich at the readings you know, a month or so ago of putting health and health information in the hands of the people. Other policies that we might implement might direct themselves at patients rather than at doctors, and they might be preventative rather than curative in nature. Here's one of my very favorite, simplest examples, which was in the readings. Here what the investigators did is they simply placed signs in a large mall and watched how they affected 17,901 shoppers over the course of three months. So what they did is, is on experimentally different days, they went and they put up a little sign near the uh, escalator, and the signs either said, your heart needs exercise, use the stairs, or it said, improve your waistline, uh, use the stairs. And, uh, and what they found is, is that uh, this is the percentage of shoppers, and then they hid behind a little blind, and they just counted what happened. Did the people use the stairs or not? They saw someone approach, read the sign, oh, okay, and go use the stairs. And they found that at baseline, 4.8% of the people used the stairs, and with a health benefit sign, that went up to 6.9% used the stairs. And with a weight control sign, it went up to 7.2% of individuals used the stairs. And there was some demographic patterning, uh, you know, according to weight class that they observed, race, sex, and age, which I won't go into uh, right now. And in some way, these results are too good to be true. Think about the cost effectiveness of this. If each sign and easel cost about $60, it would cost $200,000 to place a sign in every single regional mall in the United States. $200,000, you could put this in the whole country. And if only 4% of shoppers use the stairs in each of these malls, roughly 1.6 million more Americans would take the stair each day than before because of this little sign intervention. And the caloric cost of walking up or down two flights of stairs each day, it's about five calories per flight, would amount to a weight loss of up to five pounds for an average man over the course of a year. And as we saw, it's only small differences like this that might actually materially affect the obesity epidemic. Here's another example of something similar advocated. Now, this internet made the rounds like every few years this goes viral. I don't know if it's gone viral this year. If it has, forgive me, I'm going to show it to you. Uh, this is another example of nudging advocated by uh, Thaler and Sunstein and others based on basic uh, psychological principles. How can we modify our environment 
working and get, make, get more people to choose the stairs by making it fun to do. Typical in Sweden, right? Anyway, it's very inventive. And, uh, and contrast that, I have no idea what that is. Uh, contrast that with this sort of situation here. This is our society, people. <laughs> so you buy the health club 24 hour fitness, and look, they're taking the escalator up. Um, and as we discussed a little while ago, um, and so, and, uh, you know, uh, as we discussed a little uh, while ago, even a slight increase or decrease in the average caloric intake or energy expenditure can have huge population level effects. This is a slide from a few lectures ago, and it shows that the median of the distribution of estimated energy accumulation that accounts for the observed weight gain of about two pounds per year in Americans aged 20 to 40, uh, and it's only in excess of about 15 kilocalories per day, or three flights of stairs, as we just discussed. So the average American, if they could just exercise a little bit more every day, then we would efface the cumulative weight gain in our society. And in fact, some policies could approximate the removal of the handle on the Broad Street pump. There might be ways in which we could design public policies that are so clever and so subtle uh, that, and so deft that they are like removing the handle on the Broad Street pump and kind of move population health in desired uh, ways. And in the case of smoking, in fact, uh, we've used more uh, than mere signs. Uh, for example, uh, we had a multifactorial approach that targeted many aspects of the problem, as we saw earlier in the, in the course. We have labels on cigarette packs. We've got excise taxes. We've got clean air laws. We've got laws against sales to minors. We've got advertising restrictions. We've got counter marketing and social movement examples. We deploy the full panoply of interventions. And in one of the readings we saw today, we even saw how we could pay people to smoke and giving, uh, to quit smoking, and giving them a $750 incentive materially increased the risk uh, that people would be able to, uh, so here's the model adjusted for stratification variables. Uh, so for example, uh, in the uh, incentive group, you could almost triple the odds of smoking cessation uh, with this moderate incentive. Now you might think $750 is a lot of money, but believe me, it, uh, it is totally cost saving with respect to the cost that a smoker will impose on our society and on, on himself or herself. So if we are serious about improving health, we must see that increasing access to and use of medical care, however commendable, is a, uh, however commendable a goal it is for pragmatic or moral reasons, is not the same as health promotion. And in fact, medical care is not the same thing as health improvement. Our system does poorly when health and medicine differ. Uh, a better system would pay for health, uh, health improvement, rather than mere service provision. And the current system does not pay for many things that are of great value. It is, once again, the problem of underinvestment in public goods. See you next time. <laughs>